Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today we're going to start a multi-part series on the science, the deep science behind nuclear weapons. Why am I doing this? Well, because I'm a physicist and I'm kind of fascinated by them. Because many of the rockets that I've talked about started out as launch vehicles for nuclear weapons, and because in video games, which I love, they are constantly used as MacGuffins for all sorts of plot. They are used sometimes as weapons. Sometimes the player is racing to defuse them before they bring death and destruction. Other times we are exploring worlds which have been laid to waste by nuclear devices and occasionally you actually get to design them as part of the game. And of course beyond games, nuclear weapons figure into politics all the time where people who sh perhaps should know better sometimes ignore some of the finer points because it's, well, less convenient. But before I get down to the nitty gritties of the history and the physics, I want to clear up one giant misconception which keeps continuing to rear its ugly head in many comments. Nuclear weapons are actually incredibly hard to detonate by accident. They require a very precise series of uh, operations to be happen to, to occur with amazing temporal precision. If this doesn't happen, then the bomb typically will not work. So if you find a weapon in a room, it's not something to be treated delicately. It's not something that you worry about shooting by accident or hitting or punching or setting fire to or crashing spaceships into or whatever. It probably won't explode. At worst, you might get a chemical explosion which uh, throws radioactive shrapnel around, which is definitely a bad thing but it is a long way from the true horror of a proper thermonuclear explosion. So with that out of the way, let's go back to the origin. The actual term atomic bomb was actually coined by H.G. Wells back in 1913 in a book called The World Set Free. Now, back then they knew that the energy contained within nuclei were much, was much higher than the energy in the electron clouds around. So the atomic bombs in his story were more like hand grenades that when uh, they landed they would explode and they would continue exploding, releasing this continuous energy for months or even years after the battles. In 1932, the first people to split the atom were Cockcroft and Walton, who had constructed a primitive particle accelerator. They were able to accelerate protons up to high energies, and they were slamming them into lithium nuclei. And they observed that the lithium-7, upon bombarding with, uh, upon bombarded with by a proton, would split into two helium nuclei. Now, by this point, Einstein had published his famous equation, E equals mc squared, and they knew that the mass of the two helium nuclei was less than the mass of the lithium-7 and the proton. Therefore, energy must have been released. So by splitting the atom, they had demonstrated that it was possible to release energy from atomic processes, but many people still were skeptical of it ever being a viable energy source. In fact, Rutherford went so far as to call the process or the prospect of atomic energy moonshine. Basically, the energy required to power their particle accelerator was vastly greater than the amount of energy that they could possibly have gotten out of their lithium. In December of 1938, nuclear fission was discovered. Now, originally it was a team uh, consisting of Otto Hahn, Lise Mettner and Fritz Strassmann who were they were looking to make heavier elements, so what they were doing was taking neutrons and bombarding the heaviest element they could find, uranium. And what they instead found, they were finding lighter elements like barium. And this was a bit confusing to them. Now during the work, of course, uh, this was in Germany and Hitler was rising to power, uh, Lise Mettner had to leave because she was of Jewish descent and had moved to Sweden. She was still corresponding with her co-workers and they were uh, discussing this particular problem. There she was visited by her uh, nephew, who Otto Frisch, who had been working with Bohr, who on his Bohr atomic at model. And uh, they discussed this particular problem and uh, Otto, Otto Frisch came upon the idea that this may be fission, as in 
It was very similar to, to a biological fission of a cell, but instead it was the nucleus of an atom fissioning into two things. And uh, so yeah, that was where the term came from. And obviously they all contributed, but of course they didn't all get the Nobel Prize. In fact, Lee Mechner definitely deserved to get in on that whole thing. Later it was shown that when a uranium nucleus underwent fission, it also released neutrons. And by the middle of 1939, there was plenty of theoretical data to suggest that a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction could be initiated under the right circumstances. Since many of the world experts were based in Germany or had come from Germany, uh, there began to be some concern that the Nazi government might actually be pursuing or investigating the prospects of a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. Although the truth is that many of the experts had already been forced to flee the country. This concern led to the famous Einstein-Zillard letter warning President Roosevelt about the possibility of an atomic weapon. Now much of the actual work had been done by Leo Szilard, but by having Einstein's name on the letter, it was to ensure that Roosevelt would uh, pay attention to it. Uh, Leo actually visited Alfred uh, in 19, August 1939, and apparently the driver, the guy that drove him there, was uh, none other than Edward Teller, who would of course go on to invent the hydrogen bomb. However, the weapon that was conceived in that uh, letter is vastly different from what we consider to be atomic bombs these days. So the letter said, and I quote, the, this new phenomenon would also lead to the construction of bombs, and it is conceivable, though much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may be thus constructed. A single bomb of this type carried by boat and exploded in a port might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. However, such bombs might very well prove to be too heavy for transportation by the air. So why was the bomb described by Einstein too heavy to be delivered by aircraft, when we know that modern devices can be light enough to be carried by a person? Well, let's get into the physics! You're probably familiar with the notion of a nuclear chain reaction where the neutron triggered fission generates extra neutrons which then collide with other nuclei and trigger more fissions. But of course the real science is a little more complex. When you have a neutron travelling through the fissile core, there's four things that can happen. One is that it can travel beyond the core and be lost, right? The second is that it could be absorbed by a nuclei and change the element. The third is that it could scatter off the nuclei, bounce off and exchange some energy. But the fourth possibility is that the neutron could come in and trigger a fission in the nucleus. Now what you really want to have happen is number four. Number one and two basically result in neutrons being lost to the system. Three kind of balances out because of course you're not destroying them, you're just changing the energy. So what you want is for at least one neutron generated from each fission to generate at least one more fission so the reaction is self-sustaining. Now the chances of each of these things happening depends upon what's called the nuclear cross-section, which is a complex function of the neutron energy, and it's different for each isotope. When these are measured for naturally occurring uranium, it was discovered that the cross-section decreased as the neutron's energy increased. Now, the cross-sections are measured in barns, incidentally, as in can't hit the side of a barn. One of the problems with sustaining a chain reaction is that the neutrons that emerge from these fission events have energies of about one mega electron volt. But if you look at the diagram, then you'll see that around uh, one electron volt, the cross section for fission is about 100 times larger. So if you want to make a chain reaction, then you really want some process to slow those neutrons down, and this is called moderation. It works best when you scatter neutrons off of light atoms, uh, and that will basically lose energy. Now, lighter atoms basically recoil more when they're hit, and uh, they will therefore be better at dissipating the energy. The moderator should be something as well which uh, doesn't have much chance of absorbing the neutrons either. 
So hydrogen is really good at dissipating because of course it is very very light but it also has a chance to absorb a neutron and turn into deuterium. And that's why heavy water was of great interest early on because deuterium has a much lower chance of absorbing a neutron so therefore uh, you got the lightest possible e uh, new element, the lightest possible isotope to scatter your stuff with the least chance of, of it uh, absorbing the neutrons and reducing your efficiency. So based upon the best information at the time, it was thought that a nuclear weapon would consist of hundreds of tons of uranium and moderator to make a reaction that worked. Uh, around this time the US government did actually begin research into uranium, but they weren't explicitly looking at the possibility of a weapon just yet, they were more concerned with building a self-sustaining nuclear reactor. And of course this would become the Chicago Pile, but we'll talk about that in the next episode. It wasn't until 1940, with the war properly underway, that Otto Frisch and Rudolf Perels wrote a historic memoranda which showed that the critical mass required to sustain a chain reaction was vastly smaller than scientists had previously considered. Up until this point most experiments had been carried out using naturally occurring uranium, but as you probably know, naturally occurring uranium is made of two different isotopes. Uh, uranium-238 is by far the most common, uh, making up something like 99.3% of natural uranium. Uranium-235 makes up 0.7%. Uranium-238 is much more likely to absorb the neutrons than it is to fission, by a factor of about a thousand, whereas uranium-235 is about a hundred times more likely to fission when seeing a neutron. But the good news is that if you brought the neutron energy down to about one electron volt, you could make a self-sustaining nuclear reactor with uh, naturally occurring uranium. So if you want to make a nuclear bomb, you really want to have more uranium-235 and you want to get rid of all that uranium-238. The uranium-235 is much better at sustaining a chain reaction without having to go to the trouble of moderating all those neutrons down to low energies. Uh, after you do the math it comes out that you can get a, a critical mass of about 52 kilograms which is more easy to carry in an aircraft as you can imagine. The Frisch Pearls memoranda showed British scientists that an atomic weapon was indeed achievable. And it's worth noting that because they were Austrian and German, they had actually been locked out of Britain's existing research program into uranium, which by that point had decided that atomic weapons were not in fact workable. But the letter reignited interest and led to the foundation of the MOD committee, and later to the British Atomic Weapon Program, which went under the moniker Tube Alloys. The Tube Alloys pro uh, project was also responsible for a number of other important ideas, such as showing that weapons could be made from plutonium-239, which could be created by, uh, well, when uranium-238 absorbed a neutron and subsequently underwent beta decay. Eventually this information would find its ways to the US scientists and the Manhattan Project would kick into high gear, finally knowing that an atomic weapon was possible. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.